The TR2 and those original runs, there's a fair number of them that have become known as the kitchen table knives. So they're the original group of Protex, both in TR1s, 2s, and then the runs that I literally built at home on my kitchen table. All the parts were outsourced. I uh, took them down to Ross Cutlery for my dad and I to sharpen them, you know, that whole thing. And uh, it's become a bit of a thing, like, you know, every once in a while, one will pop up for sale, and they'll actually use that vernacular kitchen table runt for sale. It's fantastic. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 116 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, which is the place for knife noobs and knife junkies to learn everything about knives and knife collecting. Hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, anybody who loves knives. The Knife Junkie Podcast is the place for you. How you doing today, Bob? Another great show. I'm doing great. I'm really excited. We uh, I spoke with Dave Wattenberg uh, of ProTech Knives, the makers of my absolute favorite out the side automatics. Mm -hmm. And uh, great guy. I've seen him in interview many times, and it was such a pleasure to uh, actually meet him and talk with him. Absolutely. So we'll get to that interview right now. Visit The Knife Junkie at thenifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. I'm here with Dave Wattenberg of ProTech. Dave, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. We've got a lot to talk about. I've I've seen a lot of uh, videos over the years of people coming up and interviewing you at SHOT Show and stuff like that, and I've had a taste of some of what the ProTech story is, but I'm, I'm excited to have you here and uh, have a chance to talk to you. Um, when you and I spoke on the phone a couple weeks back, I told you that my first ProTech was uh, the Rock Eye, the, the Les George Rock Eye. I was a huge fan and am a huge fan of that, of his design, but kind of knew it was always sort of out of reach. And then you made this beautiful automatic and and had the uh, the reputation for making high fidelity and uh, um, collaboration knives and just incredible out the side. So I got it and uh, I love it. Um, so thank you for making something that I loved and bringing it into reach and creating a whole new uh, genre of knife that I love. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, the Les George designs, I, he's been a good friend and a great collaboration partner. And uh, same sort of thing. I, I really love his designs. And he's such a neat guy. Uh, we're really proud to work with him. And you came out with the SBR recently, which is a kind of a smaller version of that same knife. And, and, and it's SBR, right? Yep. Short bladed rock eye. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what a hit that little guy has been. You know, it it's such a nice size. It's small, but it's still stout, like the Les George designs tend to be. Right. And so it's it's like the best little big knife we ever made. <laughs> and you make a lot of little big knives, and I think that might be a result of uh of being in California, but we'll get to that in a second. I wanna I wanna find out about how ProTech came to being. Uh I, I understand from an interview I saw with you, you grew up in a knife shop. Uh, is that right? And and how did this C correct? How did this evolve? Yeah, so my dad and my uncle owned a retail knife uh, store, Ross Cutlery, right in the heart of downtown Los Angeles. And when my dad was getting out of the service uh, during Vietnam, uh, he and his brother were looking for a business that they could work together, and they met this guy, Mister Ross, who had a sharpening service. Uh, they didn't sell anything in the store at the time; it was just sharpening and. Uh, they brokered this deal to buy the business from him and over the years grew it and grew it and just built it into one of the biggest and most well-stocked cutlery stores anywhere in the U.S. And I grew up in there. You know, I grew up at, uh, you know, as soon as I was tall enough to reach the counter, I was selling knives, uh, you know, down at the store. And I remember vividly, you know, being there making little price tags and working with my dad and there was just uh, it was it was really great, you know, uh, kind of unusual in conversation. You know, people talk about what their dad did for a living, and I was always the only one whose dad ran a knife shop, uh, for sure. <laughs> the luckiest one in the class, huh? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, what were the kind of knives you were selling back then in the in that store? So, a little bit of everything. My dad's store, my dad and my uncle's store, had kind of a focus on I don't know, almost utilitarian stuff. They do a lot of service work. So butchers, barbers, you know, hair stylists, people that use knives as tools every day, 
that need service for them. You know, they would come in there for sharpening, um, even real specialty items like straight razors and things. And, uh, you know, the service side, real heavy for the retail store. And they, they had all manner of knives in there, a little bit of everything. My dad loved inventory, <laughs> um, you know, kind of an old school approach to it. You know, like you can't sell it if you don't have it, my dad would say. And so, uh, boy, did they have it down at the store. And he had a number of collections of things in the front window that were bolted on, that were display only, not for sale. And there was one area there that was all automatic knives, vintage American, vintage Italian, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, I guess growing up being told over and over again that I couldn't touch them <laughs> and I couldn't have them and whatever, it's like the circle of life. And so all these years later, uh, you know, uh, Ross Cutlery, even though it's changed hands now, my cousin owns mm. it. They're a customer of ours and they buy the ProTech knives and sell them at Ross Cutlery. Uh, so it's the circle of life for sure. Oh, that is so cool. So did your father and uncle uh, make knives or have an inkling to go that route? Not at all. They bought and sold and serviced, you know, countless knives over the, I think uh, when my dad was still alive, it, when they ran the store together, I want to say 52 years, something like mm -hmm. that. Incredible longevity and uh, moved several times, every time into a bigger location. Um Phenomenal success, you know, for a retail store, uh, but never any knife making to speak of, uh, but heavy on the service side, lots of knives sold, but no, no knife making. So, you know, the sort of level of enthusiasm in the knife world these days, you helped build that enthusiasm through your ProTech brand. But uh, was it like that back in the day where people, were, what, was your dad a knife nut? Was your, was your uncle like always getting the new thing and, and loving, or was it a different sort of attitude then? No, they, they were. And, and actually, you know, like my, my dad was involved in a number of things with different cutlery companies over the years, helping them expand their brands, especially Boker. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, he, he always loved the product beyond that. It was his work. Uh, he had a genuine enthusiasm for the knives and the new stuff that was coming in and, uh, you know, definitely, Beyond just buying and selling stuff, uh, you know, he was ahead of his time, kind of a knife nut for sure. So you grow up working in the store, Ross Cutlery, and uh, I, I'm presuming that you kind of grew up there, as you said, and went into your teen years yep. uh, there. So how did it happen that you, I mean, how did it happen that you started making them yourselves? So I, I after college, I ended up as a teacher for a short time, I actually taught middle school, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade for a few years. And while I was teaching, I was trying to buy my first house and get, you know, kind of my life started. And I was work at the time living in Colorado and the teacher pay was not so hot. And so I, on the weekends, I started doing knife shows. I started doing gun shows, knife shows, buying and selling brands I was familiar with, you know, from my dad's store. So Benchmade, Sog, Cold Steel, Spyderco, you name it. And pretty quickly that evolved into also some custom knives. And I really enjoyed buying and selling those and getting to know the makers. And um, I had a pretty good side business going and eventually that kind of took over. And so this is like you know mid nineties. And the thing that I would always sell out of the first, partly because I enjoyed them so much, it's easy to sell what you like. And, <laughs> and I loved the automatic knives. And so at the time, like in the mid nineties, there just weren't that many there, you know, Benchmade had a few great models, the white wolf knives, some stuff from the Valentin family. Mm -hmm. Like there was a few things out there, but there wasn't much. And I realized how much I liked them and other knife, you know, nuts like me liked them. And so, uh, that's kind of when I got the idea that maybe I should try to make my own. I think, um, in the, in the mid nineties, that's kind of when I, uh, when I got my first uh, large folding cold steel and I started to become aware of some of the brands I couldn't afford at the time. To me, that's when the real uh, robust builds started happening and a real eye towards tactical uh, tactical knives started happening. So I think the idea of taking um, the idea of, a, of an automatic knife, but building it to be battle ready, quote unquote, uh, is a great idea. I grew up, uh, you know, in the 80s, I, I got a bunch of switchblades and out the front uh, automatics from Europe that were, you know, um, tourist pieces and fun to play with, but obviously sure. were not good knives. Yep. And so to take the fascination or, or the, uh, you know, that, the, 
the fascination of having an automatic knife, but actually making it a working tool. Great idea. Oh, yeah. And with premium materials and all the modern CNC and all the you know advancements in manufacturing, uh, to take that you know, kind of childhood love and that you know uh, fascination with them and turn it into something that's a well-built product, uh, it's, it's what I do for a living. <laughs> well, so how how do your ProTech knives differ? And I'm, and let's let's start with the um, what you're known best for, which is your out the side automatics. Yep. How do those knives differ from the tr- traditional Italian stilettos that James Dean carried or that you and I grew up with? How sure. are they different? So materials and manufacturing processes have obviously come a, a really long way. Uh, there's a a host of amazing blade steels on the market today, and we, we like 154 CM a lot, but we're also using 20 CV and S35 and all this. And I mean, it's a world away from, you know, where the steels were back in the James Dean, you know, days. Who knows what those were? <laughs> um, and then, you know, the manufacturing processes as well, all the tolerances that we're able to hold today were unthinkable back then, except for a few maybe hand craftsmen that would spend, you know, a year making a knife. Um, you know, and so the tolerances, the materials, all of that really has become available fairly recently to allow us to build at a level of precision. Uh, you just couldn't have done it back then. Um, it's, it's really pretty incredible. Well, what about the actual mechanism, the springs and the, and, and how it, um, so my old, uh, Italian stilettos, you know, Mm -hmm. from, from Europe, um, they have a, like a a bar in them that you have to sort of, a leaf spring. A leaf so spring, exactly. Yours are very different and have a different feel. How how a how is yours? So yeah. There's a torsion spring. It's a coil spring, and it's wound uh-huh. around on the inside. So there's that constant tension through the action all the way through. There's tension on the blade, and it, it gives you this crisp, you know, sharp opening. Um, and then if it's interrupted, if you bump it against something halfway, it'll continue open and all the way open from there. Uh, they're very reliable. Uh, they're built where they can be changed easily. And we do have customers wear out springs. It's funny with that. People often ask, you know, like, how long is the spring going to last? And a lot of people never wear one out. You know, they rotate their knives and they, you know, they, they only open it when they need to cut something. But then you have other folks who it's, it's like their fidget spinner, you know, open, closing, <laughs> yes. open, closing, open, closing all the time. And they will wear out their springs obviously sooner. So there's no set time frame on that. Everyone kind of, you know, has their own pace. But I would say on average, we found that folks that rotate with other knives and, and use them, you know, not as a, uh, you know, fidget spinner, uh, usually 10, 12 years, the springs will last. Wow. And then we've had a few customers that go through them so fast, we finally just broke down and sent them a bag of springs, <laughs> uh, you know, and, <laughs> and gave, them a, <laughs> gave them a little tutoring session about how to change it. Um, you know, they're sitting somewhere all day, snap, 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 yeah. snap. And, uh, Certainly, that's fun, but you, you will go through some springs. You'll go through a couple of wives that way too. P- very possibly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned something interesting uh, that uh, when you when the action is interrupted, you press the button, the the blade fires. The huge difference between that continuous uh, tension of a coil spring and a leaf yep. spring is that the leaf spring will stop if it doesn't go all the way open and lock. It'll stop, and then it'll just stay at whatever angle it it stopped. Uh, Correct. But but your knife, uh, because it's under constant uh, tension, will will always open all the way up. All the way, yep, every time. And and the longevity is much better. Uh, the spring power, although there are some beefy leaf springs out there, mm-hmm. um, you know. And and there's uh, we actually do make a couple of models. They're double actions that use a leaf spring, but right. the vast majority are uh, coil springs. This coil spring action has mm-hmm. kind of become uh, state of the art. I mean. Or, is that the is that the term I want to use? Oh, it's, it's kind it's of evolved. what everyone uses now. It is. Um, you pick up a, a Kershaw launch. It's that. Yep. Everything seems like that. Is this something that you guys brought brought to the fore? Oh, I wouldn't say that. It's it's a we've we've taken. I mean, coil springs. There are coil spring autos from the 1800s. Oh, okay. um, there's some you know from way back, uh, but it has evolved tremendously over the years and. The way we have our springs made, the way we set them, all of it is very, very finely tuned. Uh, there are certainly some other folks who do a good job of it, um, but we do have, I, I, you know, for my own 
taste the best action in the business. Uh, and it's a combination of a lot of things. It's not just the spring. A lot of it's the tolerances uh, and the time we take to machine the blades and the handles and grind to within you know tenths and all these measurements and things. So you can have the strongest spring in the world, but if there's something off somewhere else, it won't feel quite right. And sometimes you'll pick one up that's fast, but it's got a little rattle to it or it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's not tight. Uh, and so having it lock open tight, nice and solid, and have the speed, uh, we're tinkering with it constantly, constantly making adjustments you know, on our programs to keep that you know, feel just where we want it. It seems like that is a real... Um a real science to dial in. I, I have experienced, not on a ProTech, uh, but I have experienced such strong springs that they don't even lock open. They kind of bounce back a little bit. Mm-hmm. And um, that's almost uh, uh, cutting off your nose to spite your face. It's just a little right. bit too much action. But I, I appreciate the strive for that snappy um, action. Incidentally, uh, I once characterized Protex as snappy versus uh, my Benchmade uh, uh, ATC, ATF. As uh, AFO. Sla- AFO, yes, sorry. Yep. That's slappy. I love that knife, but it slaps Very open. Nice. Yep. Or snaps open. A little, little different. So what was the first ProTech automatic model? So the first couple of things we kind of made at the same time were the original runt, so the under two inch California legal uh, job. And then also the first two knives in our tactical response series, the TR1 and the TR2. Uh, and so those kind of all launched at about the same time and kind of got things rolling. I have the TR2 with me uh, a lot. I love this uh-huh. knife. Uh, I have the one with the knurling up front. You guys nice. do knurling like no one else, by the way, and your jimping is Thank incredible. You. Sure. Uh, <laughs> that being said, I-, I love the way this thing opens up. It almost jumps out of your hand. This is like a little bruiser. Love this oh, knife. Yeah. It-, it gets a lot of outdoor use. I bought it from a man in uh, in Oklahoma who used it uh, on his farm. So Nice. Yeah, the TR2 and those original runs, there's a fair number of them that have become known as the kitchen table knives. So they're the original group of Protex, both in TR1s, 2s, and then the runts that I literally built at home on my kitchen table. All the parts were outsourced. I took them down to Ross Cutlery for my dad and I to sharpen them, you know, that whole thing. And uh, it's become a bit of a thing. Like, you know, every once in a while, one will pop up for sale. And they'll actually use that vernacular kitchen table runt for sale. Oh, it's that, fantastic. <laughs> and that, that must have an awesome uh, secondary market asking price. At, like, they do. And it, it's it's fun too sometimes to see them come back in for service. And it's like, you know, that's a thing that we, you know, I always say we, and I guess back then it was just me, um, that I sat at home on my kitchen table and, and built. And then you see it come back all these years later and they need a spring or they need it sharpened or something like that. It's a hoot when they come back in. That's, that is amazing. That's like, um, you know, uh, looking at old, I, I do, I, I've been an artist my life, you know, so you look back at old drawings and you remember that time of your life. Yep. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it's the same with a knife, but you can remember making that particular thing and, um, the other the other thing I found really interesting, a lot of times when people send in a knife that they've had that long, they feel so attached to it. They'll call in advance and they're like, hey, I'm sending in this runt I've had. And they always exaggerate because to them, it feels like they've had it even longer. So they're like, Dave made this himself 30 years ago. And it's like, <laughs> we, we weren't even making knives yet, but they <laughs> feel like they've had it so long. And so pretty regularly, they'll call in advance and they'll say, this knife I've had for 30 years um, I'm sending it in and make sure that someone takes care of it. And, you know, they're very, very cautious and they want to make sure that they're going to get the same one back, that we're not going to substitute it with some new model and throw off their whole thing. Uh, and so we, we, <laughs> every once in a great while something comes back that, you know, can't be saved. It's, you know, been used past the point of uh, whatever, but almost always, you know, we send somebody back the exact same knife to make sure that they keep their, you know, uh, 30 years of history and the 20 right. year knife. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I mean, what a, what a great compliment though. Uh, I would imagine as a knife maker, a knife manufacturer to get something that's been so loved over the years when there, when there have been a million opportunities to cast it aside for another knife, you know, yep. and, and use that one all the time. Oh, it is. It becomes, you know, it becomes someone's part of their personal effects. You know, you've got things that you carry and use every day and, uh, you know, they'll send it in. They're like, you know, I'm sending, you know, a a law enforcement officer just the other day was sending something in and he said, I'm going to be lopsided until I get it back. (laughs) That's cool. That's cool. It's a part of him. Yeah. 
That's funny. That reminds me of a story I saw uh, on YouTube of a guy talking about his TR3, and it was the one with the dragon scale or fish scales mm -hmm. on it. Fish scale, yeah. So cool. Actually, when Thanks. I bought this, I was looking for that, and uh, it wasn't out at the time, and I saw this SWAT version. I was like, oh, yes, I must have that. Uh, but he was talking about how he carried it through deployments, and then I think he brought it back and then lost it in the garden, something like that, pulled it oh, out yeah, a couple yeah, of years yeah. later, yeah. and it fired on the first thing, and he, you know, kept opening it and closing it, and there was never a malfunction. And I just remember thinking, I, I have to get the TR3, because I've always thought it was a, a um, TR3, the TR2 are really classic looking knives to me. Yeah, thanks. The, yeah. the TR3 is also the knife that we've had the most um, direct business with, you know, elite military units. Mm. The fish scale version in particular is the one that we build for the Naval Special Warfare, you know, SEAL teams. and. Originally, we'd sent over some samples of TR3s with grooves and other treatments, and we kind of dreamt up with one of their weapons officers that whole idea of the fish scale. So that's really their knife. And uh, yeah, we're, you know, always humbled and thrilled, you know, that they chose to buy and carry our product. And uh, the units that they receive are marked a little bit differently than the commercial ones, but otherwise, it's exactly the same knife. Um, that fish scale TR3, we're especially proud of. Uh, be before I saw that video, uh, though I already had the uh, the Rockeye, uh, ProTech Rockeye, I always kind of thought as, I always kind of thought of automatics as kind of fidgety, a little bit like, um, almost uh, like you don't want to, you don't want to bring them into that atmosphere because stuff might get inside and stop yeah. the action. And and I'm discovering, and, and through this podcast, others have told me that is actually not the case at all. It's kind of the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. The button lock is a very clean mechanical system. There's, there are not too many parts. There's very little to go wrong. They're very specific to machine. And a lot of times outside machinists, experts, let's say someone coming into it for the first time that might have even aerospace or medical experience for machining, they'll look at it and they'll say, oh, that's, that's going to be a piece of cake. I could machine that. You know? And then they actually get into it and they find out all those little dynamics of tolerance between the push button, the cavity that the push button slides up and down in, the blade, all these little things. And if there's the tiniest bit of error from one to the other, it either works or it doesn't. It's a very specific type of machining and it's not easy. But once it's done and once it's done well, it is a very rock solid mechanical system and it has much fewer parts than a lot of other systems. So it is very reliable uh, under a lot of different conditions. I know that you have done a bit of out the front. Uh, what, what is what is your out the front knife? The Dark Angel. The Dark Angel. That's what it is. And it has a groove down the middle. Is that a single action or a double action? Sorry. Single action. Okay. So how do you, obviously out the side is your, is your MTA, but how do you feel about the out the front? What are, what are the different challenges and is it worth it? <laughs> you know, there, there are some beautifully built out the front auto knives on the market um, the, the one thing about any of them, no matter how well they're done mechanically, they're kind of back to that older set where, you know, if you interrupt them somewhere in their mechanism, the double action out the front knives, if you interrupt them, the blade just flops around and you're, you have to kind of reset it. And it even, even the most beautifully built one mechanically, they're the same as those, you know, cheaper ones. And so, I don't know. I, I do I do appreciate some of them and how well they're done, uh, but there's something for us about that spring all the way through the mechanism uh, that really were I don't know just sort of stuck on. I guess um, you know, we, in the Dark Angels, the same thing with a single action out the front. You've got that power all the way through, and if you interrupt one of those part way, it will finish opening the rest of the way. Can you please explain that to me? Actually, the sure. difference between a single action and a double action. So the double action out the front, you slide a bar forward, it snaps open, you slide the bar back, and it automatically retracts. With the single action, like our Dark Angel, you push the button, it snaps open, you push the button again, and you have to use a charging bar to slide it back yourself. Okay. So the double action out the fronts have to mechanically sort of let go of the blade. There's a little sear inside that sort of flicks it forward, and then another one that flicks it back. But in between, it's just floating in there. Um, and uh, if anything interrupts it, it doesn't take much at all. A piece of paper 
uh, then it just flops around until you pull it all the way out and kind of reset it. Um, they're they're terribly, wonderfully uh, fun to play with. They really yes, are. They, sure. um, they, they absolutely are. Uh, but you know, for for a knife that someone's really going to carry and use, either EDC or military or law enforcement. Um, my personal preference would be a, a, a strong side opening auto. Uh, just the mechanical simplicity of it. I think they're they're going to get you know duty wise they're going to do well with it. Um, there are a handful of those double action out the fronts that a few people make that are beautifully done, and I know they're super high tolerance and they they do a great job. Um, but it's just not something we've dove into. Um, I guess. You know we're we're happy and we enjoy doing what we do and uh, we've got a great following for it so we've kind of stuck with it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously you've you've you're the the first name inside opening Automax as far as I'm concerned, uh, and many people and uh, you know it, it seems like a cool and interesting project to try not to try but to make a single action out the front. I like I I didn't know that about how the blade will persist even if interrupted. When I was a kid, there was the the urban myth that if you hold a, we call them stilettos <laughs> back in the day, hold it up to someone and then flick it, it'll like go all the way into their body. Right, um, right. Maybe there's a better chance with a single action, but it's a, it's an unrealistic fantasy. So for sure, for sure. California to me, yes. when I think of California, I think of um, uh, uh, not very tolerant place uh, when it comes to weapons, knives, guns, and that kind of thing. Um, what are the challenges of having a knife company, especially uh, uh, one that's controversial? Not that your company is controversial, but switch bit, the switch blade, so to speak, are controversial. Yeah. What's that like being in California? It was well described in an article or something about us a while back. They they said something like behind enemy lines where Protech operates, and I saw it and I thought, you know, that does kind of sum it up behind enemy lines. Anyway, it, it's. It is a challenge. Uh, you know, I grew up in Southern California and other than living in Colorado for a few years, uh, you know, right out of college, uh, it's my home and I've always, you know, been comfortable here. But manufacturing anything in California is difficult. Uh, you know, there are a fair number of extra regulations and obviously taxes are high and all mm -hmm. these other things. And, you know, the knife part of it is difficult. You know, we get people all the time that want to come by the shop and look at knives or buy knives. And I, I'm, I'm worn out on saying no to that, but we, we have to say no. You know, we don't have a showroom. We're not open to the public. Um, and sometimes I, I guess there's part of me that maybe, maybe that's, that's a blessing. You know, like I, I guess if, if people were coming by all day and wanting to chat about knives, we probably wouldn't get any knife making done. Um, right. So it does allow us to focus in a very real way on design, engineering, manufacturing, assembly, all the the actual making of the knives, as opposed to trying to you know run over and show a guy a couple knives in the showroom kind of a thing. Uh, if we were in you know Arizona or Oregon or Texas or now there's about forty states where autos are legal. Yeah, uh, I'm sure we would have and enjoy a showroom. But for us, you know, uh, other than local law enforcement and some military folks who come by, we're pretty much closed to the public, and uh, it's regrettable. I, I would enjoy. You know, more customers being able to come into the building, um, but it's just not it's not feasible where we are. It's not you know something we can do. So we do have an unprecedented number of automatic choices uh, that are California legal. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's one of the founding things of the company, and you know there are a few. It's interesting. There are a few other companies who've I think seen how many of them we've been able to sell, and they're like, hey, we should try <laughs> one of those little two inch autos. And uh, after all these years of us doing it, now there's a couple bigger companies doing it, which is interesting. But nobody has the selection or the breadth of models or variations. Uh, you know, all the Runt series one through four, and pretty soon we're going to launch a uh, fifth Runt series. Uh, that'll be out early next year. We have the Calmigo, we have the Sprint, we have the Half Breed, which is the full size handle with the short blade. Yeah, that's cool. um, we have everything from you know, your base aluminum model up to engraved black lip pearl Damascus sprints. So from retail price, say $200 up to $2,000 in California legal autos, no one builds a range of such a niche product like we do. Yeah. And not, not even just for the, yes, 100% for the California legal, 
uh, and I've seen them pop up and there's something inherently uh, appealing about a small switchblade. I got to say a small automatic is awesome. But also, I mean, you go from, like you said, the basic, let, let's say the godson and in mm -hmm. blue with the with the aluminum handle all the way up to the most beautifully tricked out custom Protex with incredible engraving. Tell me a little bit about that. How did how did that come about? I mean, I was just uh, perusing your website before we started talking and, you know, was just reminded of, of how, some of the incredibly artistic and intricate work you guys do. Yeah. So it's a, you know, honestly, elite high end custom pieces. They're they're really more passion pieces than anything. Uh, we do sell a, a, a very good number of them. And they're they're good business for us, uh, but really that's that's more because we want to or I want to I guess mm -hmm. uh, see how far we can go and see how much we can do up in those levels. And so whenever we have a knife design, as soon as the base model is sorted out, programmed, engineered, proven, running production, um, immediately the next instinct for me is what else can we do to it? What else can we inflict on it? How else can we make it awesome? Uh, what other materials can we use? Whose Damascus can we throw at it? Yeah. Like it's just, um, and every once in a while we'll pull it off where we'll be at a show with the first production run of a given model and right alongside of it is a titanium engraved pearl Damascus. And a few different times we've, we've had so much excitement, so much enthusiasm about the custom piece that the customs have come along and actually been introduced with the standard model at the same time. Wow. And so it, it really does push us as a company. It pushes my machinists, uh, especially right now because we're machining a bunch of titanium. Um, <laughs> and so it, 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 it pushes us to be better, to make things that other people don't make or can't make. And honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm really proud of how it brings everything we do up a notch. And even if someone buys a $150 base model godson, they know that all the love and care and attention and everything to detail that that same knife model is built in a $5,000 custom piece. Um, you know, it, it just it lets them understand where we're coming from and how passionate we are about it across the line. And uh, it also makes us unique. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of companies that build the same knife model. Like we had a godfather from Julie Warinsky that was a $10,000, you know, piece. So that knife is available from $200 to $10,000 and wow. everywhere in between. And so it allows us to enjoy our work at, a, at another level. You know, there's a lot of people in the building here and I'm really thankful for it. They don't just make parts. They understand that they're making a thing that they're making a knife at a very high level. And so for all of the folks in the building, the men and women who make the parts and then build the knives, having that level come through, it just raises everybody's spirits. It raises their expectations. They understand that they're building a product at a real high level. And uh, honestly, it makes working more fun. Uh, if we just build the same knife over and over and over again, yeah. it would be boring. Uh, and so we're constantly looking for new materials, new inlays, new options. Uh, in fact, uh, this week uh, we started posting, and you'll see him around, Greg Stevens' uh, design. He's a guy that we know that does incredible leather work. Mm -hmm. And he and I were at a show, and we were talking, and I was looking at his watches. And one thing led to another, and he said how his, God, his godson was his favorite automatic knife. And, well, right now in my hand I have a – um, Greg Stevens design oh, God. leather inlaid godson. So first of its kind, and this is a vintage Swiss military leather that he's you know repurposed wow. and made these godson inlays for. It's got this. I don't know if you can see. It's got this really cool texture. Yeah. And anyway, so godson is a knife we've been making for 15, 16 years, and this week there's a brand new variation of it that we've never made before. And that's what we're all about is constantly coming up with new things. And, uh, you know, people who've fallen in love with that model will have a new one that they can see. Maybe someone who's thought about it and they've just been waiting for the right variation. Maybe the leather is the thing that speaks to them. Uh -huh. um, you know, we're hardly a day goes by here that we don't have something new coming down the pipe. Well, a, a lot of companies uh, have sprint runs of things, but they tend to go towards... Um, 
materials. Oh, this one's an mm-hmm. M390 and this one's in G10 and this one's, but uh, it seems like yours, um, not that I'm going to call them sprint runs, uh, but but your variations on your themes are on an artistic level. Okay, we're going to have this engraver engrave these handles. Oh, okay, we're going to put this exotic material here. Um, instead of just kind of, and this is not to uh, bring down anyone else, but instead of just throwing a material at it and saying, okay, this one's in M390, now buy it. Right. It's it's a there's it's not, it seems like there's an artistic challenge and and passion that goes into upgrading the knife positively beyond just its performance. Yeah, and and for myself and all the hired core knife nuts that work for me, um, you know, it's it's what gets us up in the morning. Uh, you know, is all these exciting new things and the Malibu you mentioned earlier, which is a button lock mm-hmm. flipper that we're doing. Um, you know, those the first production run is on the bench as you and I talk. Like we are, it's the birth of our new knife. I mean, we'll have nice. these ready to ship in the next few weeks and there's just nothing like it. I mean, after you know, we introduced the prototypes in January at the SHOT Show and since then all the painstaking, excruciating parts of, you know, machining and obsessing about tolerances and on and on and on. And now we're almost to the finish line and the men and women out there are going to be putting them together and we're going to be sharpening them and have them ready to ship. Um, there's nothing like that new knife coming together. Explain for listeners who might not be familiar why the Malibu is uh, it's, is different. It's kind of on, the, on line with the Cambria, the Mordax. Yep. What is so unique about engineering this kind of knife? So there's no spring in it. It's a button lock flipper and the button is only used to lock it in the open position. It has nothing to do with firing it or you know anything like that. So there's a flipper tab and you flip that tab. There's a nice detent. And one of the things that we've managed to machine, um, I think to a, a really, really unique level is that our button is the detent. So when you're closing it and you get it almost closed, there's this wonderful sort of sucking in of the blade to, you know, its resting position. And it's, it's doing a great job. Again, very difficult to machine, but once it's done, mechanically very simple. So there's little to go wrong with it. There's no extraneous parts. There's not a bunch of extra springs and gizmos and whatever. It's just the button and the blade. There's, of course, bearings that it runs on. So once you flip it open, it locks open with that same button. And then when you're ready to close it, you push the button to unlock it and you fold it closed. Um, I, I just flipped one while we were doing that. Uh, <laughs> and they, they do have a – they're a lot of fun. Um, you know, they flip super smooth and fast. And then if you hold that button and let it drop, it closes very smoothly. So it's a one-hand open-end close. Um, it's – you know, we're obviously dialed in on machining things to work with buttons. So it's right up our alley. And right. rather than getting into liner locks or frame locks or some of these other things, this is kind of a natural thing for us in a non-auto. And yeah. uh, they've been doing great. And I think this Malibu is going to be a big hit. Well, I think I think the public is crying out for it. <laughs> and yep. I, I, people are, are really tantalized by the button locks. Hogue has been knocking it out of the park and such. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you guys are the natural... Uh, you're, you're the ones who should carry that torch for sure. And thank God you are. And yep. you're, and you're, you're knocking it out of the park. Uh, I've, uh, I, I love the Mordax. I don't own it, but, uh, I love that knife. Yep. And, uh, to me, to me who, uh, you know, I'm, I'm someone who's, uh, my, my knives are all way harder core than my needs, uh, require. Sure. Right. Sure. So, so part of it is the experience of opening and closing and, and, and holding and possessing. Absolutely. And, uh, and that Mordax fits all of those, but you also know, and with all these knives, you also know you can you can do serious work with them for sure. So what I'm hearing, uh, the manual button lock uh, flipper knives, it's mostly about getting the math right, so to speak. Definitely, the geometry never lies, as uh, our, our lead machinist uh, programmer likes to say. <laughs> and so, yeah, the, the the math and the geometry on this one leaves nothing, uh, uh, you know, to be spared or missed. Uh, but when it's done, uh, boy, they are so fun to play with and they work just fantastic. They flip great. And I actually have this one is the very first uh, titanium. I don't know if you can mm. see there's kind of a fluted pattern there and a, yes. a virus pattern Damascus blade. Um, oh. And so 
this is another knife that right out of the gate, along with the first production run of black aluminum handled 20 CV stonewash blades, we're also going to have a 3D machined titanium Damascus pearl button version launching at about the same time. But let me ask you, why, uh, why aluminum? Why aluminum? All, why are automatic knives are always made out of aluminum? So we do build some titanium and some stainless frames, but the cycle times and the material costs are super high. So we, we make them and we sell them, but they're very expensive. And so okay. to get the same machining into a more EDC-friendly price point, uh, the aluminum is the ticket. And so it allows for, you know, and also it's a lot lighter weight. Mm-hmm. Um, I love aluminum, know, by the way. Yeah, it's great. And, you know, I have in my own personal rotation of knives that I carry and and customers, alum, black aluminum knives of ours that are, you know, 10, 12 years old and have hardly a scratch on them, maybe a little pocket wear around a corner or mm-hmm. something like that. If you take good care of them, they'll they'll look great for a long, long time. Uh, this sure. this is funny because um, that's that's one of my problems with your knives. The hard coat is so good on them, and I love that worn look. Yeah. But I I rotate them in and out with other knives, so they don't get so much pocket time that they wear. And I'm like, God, I and and I'm too proud to take sandpaper to them and fake it. You know, it's like <laughs> ripping you. your own. <laughs> Please jeans, don't. You know? <laughs> I won't. So so yeah, I'm just gonna have to keep one of these in my boot for the rest of my life just to get that nice, nice. wear on the corners. You'll have to earn it. <laughs> so, yeah, right, exactly. I can't I can't fake it. Um I'm no celebrity. Uh collaborations. I mentioned this earlier with the with the rock eye. To me, that's one of the hallmarks of ProTech. You do collaborations with some great designers. Uh, how do you like what what is your design philosophy in general and then and then what do you think collaborations do for you so i one of the really neat things about this whole you know path this whole you know history of our company and my background and everything as an example one of the really successful collaborations we've had in the last few years is the mike whiskers allen br1 the bolster release knife mm-hmm. super cool automatic knife because there's no button it's a hidden release and so it's a lot of fun to trick non-knife people because they can't figure it out. Uh, It's also super safe. You know, if you left one around, people wouldn't know how to open it. Uh, And it's a really neat design. It's a very classic look. So back in the mid-90s, before ProTech was even founded, I was buying and selling Mike Whiskers Allen custom knives. Uh And so I've known him since before the birth of ProTech knives. And so as we get into making our own product line, to reach back out to those people that I've known that long, that I, I love their design before I was even making knives, and say, hey, let's do something together. And so there's a pretty good number of our collaboration partners that I've known more than half my life. You know, they're people that we bought and sold their custom knives back in the day. And so to be able to, all these years later, build a knife of their design with my name on it and their name on it, um, I enjoy that tremendously. And I, I'm, I'm super proud of those relationships and how long we've known them. And I think people understand that when they collaborate with ProTech, a brand like ours, it's not going to be the biggest thing. The volume isn't going to be some tremendous number of knives, but they know that we're going to build a product they can be proud to have their name on, mm-hmm. something that's yeah. American made and well done. And they also know that we're going to do exactly what we said. Our contracts with collaboration partners are very simple and very clean. And we always take good care of those people. And we do exactly what we said we would do. And so really, we have a lot of people that are interested in working with us. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that. I love that people bring us designs all the time. And I just hope that we have enough time to make them all. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, you know, we we have a list of things that we want to make. It's my most favorite problem is that I can't make them all right now. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I by nature not a very patient person, uh, but I've learned it over these twenty years of building knives. You have to you have to be patient, and so there's, I guess, we try to look for holes in the market. We try to look for things that maybe no one is doing or not enough people are doing like these little niche things. And I guess it would really be a niche within a niche once you're talking about automatic knives and in a very specific category. Um, And we try to find things like that because as a smaller company, we realize we're not going to compete with these great big, you know, companies that are owned by a wholly owned subsidiary of some mega corporation. 
we're never going to be able to compete with those guys. And so we find these nice little niche areas and we try to sneak in there and do the very best job of it that we can. Well, in a way, you also give the opportunity to a lot of knife makers to get the ProTech treatment, to get the automatic version of what they're making. You know, I'm thinking yep. of Strider, Emerson, uh, you know, Les George, some of these, uh, well, some of them are classics like Strider and Emerson. They've been around a long time and they yep. don't make automatic knives, but their knives de deserve the ProTech treatment in a way. You know, I, I think it's so cool that you can get a, uh, you know, an SNG or a CQC7 in ProTech form. I mean, oh, yeah. Me, that it, it's fantastic for us to, you know, as a fairly young company, uh, you know, to have those makers trust us with mm -hmm. designs that they've been making that long to know that when we inflict our mechanism on it, that we're going to do them proud. Um, it's, it's really great. So, so two that are on my short list are the, um, one of the new micarta striders beautiful oh, yeah 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 and i think those are exclusive to some many, uh to some purveyor and then the other i've always loved the four inch walter brand and i've never seen or held one uh but the large brand is just oh, such a cool looking knife and you know i'm a little bit uh I, I like the larger ones i like the little bit more aggressive ones um but to me those are those are just so beautiful um but you have one the harkins double action Tell me about that. This is this is kind of a legendary thing, and uh, it comes up every once in a while. Yep. And uh, and you've just released. Tell me about it, please. So this is a knife. Jeff Harkins, one of my favorite custom knife makers, and again, somebody that I was buying and selling his custom knives, you know, twenty five plus years ago. And he actually designed the ATAC, the knife that we build specifically for us to make. And it's a knife that, when we do make it, involves three quarters of the equipment in the entire shop. So we make everything. We make the frames, we make the liners, we make the inlays, we make the blades, we machine the thumb studs, we machine the titanium pocket clips, we machine the sear. Every little part of that knife is machined in the building. And it kind of goes in a cycle where we haven't made them in a while and people are asking. And I think what happens is I forget how horrific it was <laughs> the last time we were doing it. And so it takes about four or five years for me to get over my post-traumatic stress from the last <laughs> time. And then I get talked into it and we make a batch of them and I'm pulling my hair out, which there isn't much left. I'm pulling my hair out. Veins are popping out on my neck and I'm like, we're never making this knife again. And then a few years later, you know, it's, it seems like we should do it again. And so it kind of goes in a cycle like that, but it is a tremendous double action knife. It's a beautiful design from, from Jeff Harkins and uh, they are, very special and very few and far between. Um, we actually have a group of them that we're getting ready to launch, which we would have taken to Atlanta, you know, here mm -hmm. in the next couple of weeks that are a stainless steel frame with abalone inlays. I mean, just unreal. Only a 15 piece limited edition. And then we have five of them that are also Bruce Shaw engraved on top of that. Uh, so it's the first time we've ever had anything in that range in a Harkins. So one group of only 15 and then one group of only five. Okay. I got two questions. First of all, uh, what is Bruce Shaw? Is, is that a, an engraver? He's an engraver. He's, he's the he's engraver okay. that we partner with the most. Yes. I've seen videos of him working. And I thought up until that point that everything was done with a machine, with a laser or something. And then I saw him engraving some of your knives and I was like, this dude, and he's, you know, hunched over with the, with the magnifying glasses, 100% amazing and legit. But we talked before about double action out the front automatics. Please, uh, in case listeners don't know, let us know the difference between that and the and the Harkins. Oh, uh, good double question. Action. So it's a double action side opening knife. So it has a thumb stud on the blade. You can fold it open like a conventional liner lock. Liner lock on the inside to unlock it and fold it closed. And then there's a hidden button. So there's two carbon fiber inlays on the front of a Harkins, and the bottom corner of the first inlay is where the button is hidden. So you have to know just the right spot and you press there and a leaf spring shoots it open. Then you use the liner lock and after it's been fired automatic, when you close it the first time, you'll feel the spring tension. You have to reset the spring. Then you can open and close it manually and you won't feel any spring tension. You won't know the, the spring is there at all. And so it's double action either as a regular liner lock folder or as an automatic knife. And the thing that really makes that knife is that unless someone shows you where the button is, you'd never know it. So you can carry it in Virginia. 
Uh, I, no, no, I, I'm just I, kidding. I, I don't even play a lawyer on TV. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's one of my, you know, that's where I live and I, I can own them or I do own them, but I know I can't carry them. And they yeah. were, uh, they recently tried to build a factory here to make automatic knives to export to other states and they still said no. Yeah. So that's what I'm dealing with. But, but the, uh, but, but honestly, uh, a double action automatic aside from, you know, we'll forget about the legal, uh, issues is, is a really, um, unique and kind of a, an interesting and safe way to go about carrying an automatic. Uh, you know, you can impress your friends with it if you need to, but if you're at work and you just have to open up a package, yep. uh, you can gently open it up. Yeah. It's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great system. It's a great design. They're just a mechanical challenge uh, to the point where if we tried to make them all the time, we wouldn't get anything else done. Right. Um, you know, they are, uh, um, they are really great. I, I do love that knife model. Um, and once we're done building this current production group, which is only a couple hundred knives, a couple hundred regular okay. aluminum, the 15 abalone, and then the five engraved knives. And that's the whole – that's it. Uh, and then it will probably be a few years before I have the courage to do it again. <laughs> Let me ask you, and I hope this isn't gauche, but what is the uh, what is that very high-end uh, one of five cost? You know, honestly, I, I – I sensed that you were going to ask, and I don't even know yet because I haven't gotten the bill from Bruce Shaw. Oh. So that those are so new that I actually don't know. But here in the next couple of weeks, when we would have been you know shipping them to Atlanta for the show, uh, all that will come together and we'll have pricing and you know information. And one of the things I will say about you know the current time that we're in, I, I'm so unbelievably thankful for our customer base. It's a loyal and just fantastic group of people. And so many ProTech knives have been sold online through dealers over these last couple of months. And I, I, I think people know this, but I, I just want to say it. When you buy a ProTech knife or a, a fair number of other knives that are built by smaller companies from a dealer that's online, and there's a ton of great ones but they're almost all, all of them are family owned businesses, some mm -hmm. smaller than others, but all of them small, medium, you know, family owned type businesses. It's unbelievable how many, like, let's say you buy a ProTec from Blade HQ. Today, you buy one of those SBR, a small bladed rock eye. So you've supported Blade HQ, which is a big, but small family owned company. You've supported ProTec Knives, which is a small family owned company. You've supported an individual custom knife maker because they're going to get the royalties. You've supported our heat treater up the street, which is a family owned business. Mm -hmm. You've supported, you know, the steel manufacturer. Like there are so many different people that benefit from one of those purchases. And as trying as the times are that we're in right now, I just want to say thank you to the customers for their support. And I want them to know that when they make one of those purchases, there's a cascade of support that gets spread amongst spring manufacturers, steel suppliers, aluminum sellers, the anodizing company that we use as a family-owned business. It's just such a great effect. And I, I just want to say thank you because we really appreciate it. Well, thank you for mentioning that because uh, there's so much um, people talking so much and passionate about buying U.S. made, uh, especially knives. It comes up a lot on this podcast. And, and I agree 100%. But especially when I hear that, you're not just – because I always just think, oh, I'm putting money in the pocket of the knife maker, which I love. But actually, yeah, there are so many other people all in, in that orbit that our, benefit our from that one company purchase. that prints our warranty cards. Like you can just keep you know, coming up with more people every single time. You know, the, every time we buy a new machine because we're trying to increase capacity – we have to call our electrician and his son that come over and install it. And it just, right. it, it's such a great effect. And I, uh, I, I'm sure people know it, but I just, uh, especially these days, we're so very thankful for it. Um, it's amazing. And uh, I, I, I'm sure everyone is also grateful that you are continuing to make your awesome work through all this, uh, you know, what's going on. But you mentioned family, and that really uh, is is a is also another area of interest to me. That you have a family owned business. How do you uh, how does that uh, how does that factor into things? And where do you see ProTech uh, in the future? That's a great question. Um, you know, my my dad and uncle obviously you know uh, done with the knife business, and my cousin running the retail store now. Um, I guess 
you know, my, my kids are very young, so hard to say if, you know, any of them are candidates for the knife business just yet. Um, you know, I think there's enough growth in our company and we're really in a great stage, I think, of more growth uh, that over the next little while, I'll be able to build it up to a point where it'll sustain well beyond me. And I've, you know, I, I try and obviously not think of it all the time, but it is something that I do think about, you know, that we've, I've built this thing and I'm very proud of it and people enjoy it. And, you know, it's, it's really great. And I do want it to, you know, obviously live past my years. And so, you know, over the next growth phase of the company, it is something that we have started to consider. And, uh, you know, it, it's funny over the years because in the very early days, I did everything myself, right? I, I farmed out the parts for machining from different vendors. I put them together myself and then I went and individually sold them to the customers. Mm -hmm. So a few years or a couple years into it, when we started having our first dealers, it was a strange sensation for me. So what do you, well, hold on, I'm going to sell you the knife and then you're going to sell it to somebody I don't know. Like that's cool, but I won't be there, you know, like, yeah. and, then, yeah. and, <laughs> and of course, you know, that's evolved. And then, you know, starting higher people to put the knives together. And I remember watching the first couple people put knives together and, you know, thinking, oh my goodness, you know, that's not how I do it. And then pretty yeah. soon they're probably better at it than I was, you know, and, right. and on it goes over the years. And so the next phase of that will be for, you know, not tomorrow, but down the road for me to, you know, train people to do some of the other things that I do in the office. And I, at one time I was giving someone a, a tour of the factory, which is so much fun. I, we're not able to do it very often, but I, it is a really neat break to walk someone through the shop and explain what's happening. And we got back into the front office and he looked at me and he said, you know what? He said, I get it now. He goes, you're like the conductor of the symphony. He said, there's all these different instruments, all these different players, all this going on. And you coordinate. I thought it was a really good way to describe, yes. you know, that. And I, I don't know, I don't know how easy a thing that is to teach, um, but I do love to teach. And so uh, I think someday, in probably in pieces, uh, that'll be my next challenge. Will be finding someone to teach all that too. Well, Maestro Dave Wattenberg, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Uh, you are the conductor of the preeminent. Uh automatic side opening automatic knife company and i love your work and it, it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you so much oh you great to talk to you i'm glad we did this thank you thank you so much dave thanks have a great day you're listening to the knife junkie podcast if you've got questions or comments call the 24 7 knife junkie listener line at 724-466-4487 back on episode 116 of the knife junkie podcast jim and bob here with you great uh, interview there with uh, dave from protect knives do want to remind you that if you're listening to this podcast and you like the podcast please do us a favor like and subscribe in your favorite podcast app give us a comment and uh, give us some feedback on the listener line by calling 724-466-4487 we would love to hear from you and also play your thoughts on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast also a reminder that our episode today is brought to you in part by g suite work faster work smarter collaborate on files in real time quickly find space on everybody's calendar take meetings from anywhere G Suite has the tools you need to boost your productivity, and security is built right in. You're taking advantage of the same secure infrastructure that Google uses. So if you would like to try G Suite free for 14 days, start your free trial by going to thenifejunkie.com slash G Suite. That's G-S-U-I-T-E, thenifejunkie.com slash G Suite. Start your free G Suite trial today for 14 days. All right, Bob, uh, Dave there, uh, Protect uh, Knives, uh, kind of interesting to hear uh, his childhood story, I guess, and how it uh, led to where he is today. Yeah, yeah, growing up in the knife shop and then uh, all the way to today, owning and creating the premier uh, automatic knife company. And uh, pleasure to talk with him and great to see how he is not only, uh, you know, just dominating the out the side uh, knife game with these tremendous knives, but he's also. Uh, they're doing the plunge lock, the button lock flippers now, and they mm. are so pleasing to to use, but also to open and close because 
getting a button lock flipper to that point of of uh, tuned perfection is is no mean feat, and it seems like they've nailed it. So I'm glad they're doing more. Well, if you are not yet subscribed, uh, again, as we say, to the Knife Junkie podcast and your favorite podcast app or on YouTube where you can listen to the podcast, uh, we encourage you to go to theknifejunkie.com slash subscribe. You'll be able to subscribe in your favorite podcast player right from there. And you can also subscribe to the Knife Junkies newsletter from there. And if you'd rather listen on the YouTube channel, go to theknifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. All right, Bob, uh, wrapping it up on episode 116 of the Knife Junkie podcast, as I try to do, I always let you have the the final word on your own show. Well, if you live in a place where you can get one, really try out a ProTech. They're the most amazing switchblades. All right, there you heard, heard it. And knife drop, we're out. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie person, saying thanks for joining us on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.